Can y'all hear me? I'll, I'll be louder. <laughs> so just a few uh, announcements. First, I'm, I'm Mark Nolan, Vice President of Wichita Audubon Society. And uh, our next program meeting will be in January. We're gonna have a talk in January about native plants and gardening for wildlife with native plants. So no program meeting in December, but we do have lots of Christmas bird counts happening around the area. If you go to our website, you can find out information about the, the nearby ones. We also have in December, of course, our, our monthly second Saturday bird walk at the Great Plains Nature Center here at 8 a.m. If anybody wants to come out for that. Yeah, I can say a little bit more about that. Bird count. Bird Christmas count. Bird count. Uh, so our Christmas bird count is on the 16th this year, Saturday the 16th, and we meet in the parking lot, the big parking lot out here at 7.30 in the morning. And so all are welcome, uh, no experience required, just a, maybe a good or halfway decent set of eyes to help spot birds. And so we meet up in the morning, split up. We have leaders for each of the different areas within the count circle, and then we split up and and uh, go find birds. And you can either be out in the field all day long or half day or whatever you're comfortable doing. But uh, appreciate any help if anyone's interested in participating on the bird count. And as Mark said, there's lots of uh, Christmas bird counts going on in the area. So on the Wichita Audubon website, there's the ones that are going on somewhat locally. And then on the Kansas Ornithological Society website, there's all the counts in the state are listed. So you can go there if you want to uh, participate on more counts. All right, thank you. All right, so this is an interesting talk we have here tonight. For me, especially my first love in nature was insects. And then I became a bird watcher <laughs> later on. But I'm still checking out the bugs when I see them around. So tonight we have Eric Eaton. Eric is author of Insectpedia, a brief compendium of insect lore, and also Wasps, the Astonishing Diversity of a Misunderstood Insect. He's also lead author of the Kaufman Field Guide to Insects of North America, and co-author of Insects Did It First with Gregory S. Paulson. And he has copies of some of the books back there tonight for sale if you're interested. Eric has published numerous articles and popular publications such as Birds and Blooms, Natural History, Ranger Rick, Orion, Missouri Conservationist, and Colorado Gardener. He runs the blogs Bug Eric and Sense of Misplaced, and is known far and wide as Bug Eric on the internet and social media. He has lived in Portland, Oregon, Cincinnati, Ohio, Tucson, Arizona, and Colorado Springs, Colorado, and currently lives in Leavenworth, Kansas. Welcome, Eric Eaton. <laughs> I live in Leavenworth voluntarily. I like to. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you can you hear me okay? No. <laughs> no? <laughs> no. Seriously? Yeah, we might. Okay. All right, we'll try this. I'm not even sure how to make this work. It comes out of here? It comes out of there. Oh, oh, oh. Yes. okay. Is this any better? No, marginal. I'm, yeah, I'm trying to figure out. Get this closer to you. Okay. Oh, there we go. I see. That's better? That's better. Okay. All right. Um, where was I? <laughs> um, well, I'm, I'm honored and flattered to be here uh, because typically insects don't have as much appeal as, as birds. Uh, I aim to change that, however. And in fact, my next book is going to be on, on this topic. So you're, you're getting a preview of my next work, actually. Um, and um, <laughs> there we go. So I think most of us think of, of looking at insects as something for children. I mean, we think, well, they're closer to the ground <laughs> and they're <laughs> right and they're uh, their focus is, is more attuned to things that are small, but I'm here to tell you that there's, there's reasons that it, 
that looking at insects should be attractive to everyone. And a lot of those rewards of insect watching are very similar to the rewards of, of birding. And so we'll, we'll talk about those, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the, the, the how and why of watching insects, and then go into a little bit about insect decline, and then how you can help promote insect diversity and abundance and in, in fact, biodiversity in general. And the one big thing that you can do uh, towards that end, it's not what you think, but it is the elephant in the room. Well, one of the reasons I, I got interested in insects and, and I still am is that they're beautiful. I mean, you know, isn't that why we look at birds, uh, a lot of us, because they're really, really pretty, uh, even in non-breeding colors. Uh, but so are insects, and you know we a lot of us, a lot of the general public recognizes butterflies and dragonflies as as very beautiful insects, but so are moths, and and many moths are day active by the way, like this white line sphinx moth here. But even the ones that are nocturnal can be really really pretty, whether you find them at your porch light at night or during the day just really exquisite insects. They're typically a little bit smaller than butterflies, so you have to look a little harder. And beetles, really beautiful insects, most of them. And they're really abundant. Like one out of every four species is a beetle. That, now that might change as we, we learn more about uh, other groups of insects, but, but highly abundant. And they don't call these uh, this particular kind of beetle, a jewel beetle or a metallic wood borer for no reason. They're, they're spectacularly iridescent, many of them. Their larvae, this female is laying eggs in this log and her larval offspring will bore inside of it. Tiger beetles are really spectacular and they behave a lot like shorebirds. They're, first of all, they're often found in sandy areas. You know, the, a beach is a good place to look for tiger beetles. And they, they behave a lot like sand relinks. They run really fast, stop, run again. If you get too close to, to them, they fly away, but not too far. They land again and then repeat all this. They're predatory. They feed on other small insects. And they're really the most abundant in early spring and again in the fall, although there are some species present in the summer too, but, but they're extremely diverse in this part of the country, especially in the, in the more arid regions of the Great Plains here. And beauty can, can come in very unexpected places too. This is the face of a female horsefly, and she has these like psychedelic stripes across her eyes, as many species of, of horseflies do. And, but you, you don't want to get mesmerized, so to speak, <laughs> because of course they can deliver a really painful bite. But only in life does she have those colors. Once she dies, those colors are gone. Well, insects offer a multi-sensory experience, a lot of them. Some of them smell, uh, some of them smell bad, but some of them smell good, and some of them produce sound. Now, I know, I know it's a stretch to, to equate the loud, uh, monotonous buzz of a cicada with a melodious warbler or something like that, but it, Hey, it serves the same folk, uh, purpose, right? It, it turns out that, you know, and <coughs> both attract the ladies, right? So, hey. <laughs> I think we can all agree, though, that uh, our, our after dark hours are enhanced by the, the songs of, of crickets and, and katydids. And indeed, Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote of the choruses of tree crickets. If moonlight could be heard, it would sound like that. And I think that's a very, very good description of their kind of uh, lullaby, natural lullaby. Well, I don't know if, if this is a, a perk or not of, of looking at insects or birds for that matter, but it can certainly be a challenge just to find them, right? Uh, you know, they both organisms are can fly usually, uh, they move very fast, and are otherwise kind of cryptic. And there, there are things that, uh, uh, you know, the, you have to change your search image 
and maybe start thinking like a bird if you want to watch for insects because they think of insects as prey and so they're focusing their their search image on things this chipping sparrow certainly notices this yellow jacket flying by but insects can make finding themselves finding them very very difficult this is a pretty large moth and i almost put my hand on this thing before i saw it uh, and it perfectly matches the bark of the tree that it's sitting on and many insects are exquisitely camouflaged both in the adult stage and in the larval stage. Uh, I mean, if you're going to be feeding exposed during the day, it, it, it pays to, to mimic the, the foliage that you're grazing on. Well, another reason that, that, that we look at birds uh, in particular is species diversity. I don't know if any of you keep you know, life lists or or county lists or anything like that, but certainly we want to see the most species as possible. Well, you know, insects have birds outnumbered by uh, several orders of magnitude. Uh, I just arbitrarily chose leafhoppers as an example of, of uh, insect diversity. Here in North America, north of Mexico, we have about 3,000 species. And of course, with insects, that's subject to change as we, we either find out that what we thought were separate species are actually one species or vice versa. But the other reason I picked these is because they're guaranteed to be wherever you are. Mm -hmm. uh, even if, if all you have is a lawn, you're gonna have leaf hoppers. And they come in these just amazing uh, you know, color forms, just endless varieties of, of these guys. If you turn your porch light on at night, mm -hmm. even right now, you're likely to get a few leaf hoppers because they persist uh, quite uh, readily into, into late fall. If insects ever had a fashion show, these things would rule the carpet, I think, <laughs> or the catwalk. Uh, just sheer diversity. Well, I mean, there's a, one that looks like a candy cane there and a polka dot one, and, and I'm getting hungry for peppermint. Uh, but you know, these are just things that I found in our Leavenworth yard, either by black lighting, which I'll speak to in a minute, uh, or, or just, uh, you know, found on foliage around in our yard. Well, another reason to watch any living thing is, is drama. Don't we like it when birds are, uh, are participating in some kind of action, like, like these two broad-tailed hummingbirds in Colorado that are, that are uh, having a, a little bit of a territorial tiff? Well, insects do the same thing. I mean, here or a pale, pair of, of male flame skimmer dragonflies that are competing for the same perch here and the same territory associated with that perch. Sometimes territoriality can be really spectacular. If you've ever seen a pile of ants along the edge of the sidewalk and wondered what was going on, well, it's, it's where uh, two colonies of the immigrant uh, pavement ant have met and they're having a territorial dispute. The in interesting thing about this is it's highly ritualistic. There's rarely any casualties despite this pileup of, of ants. And so we know, scientists know how these battles are initiated, but I was just reading, looking for, for information on, well, okay, how is it resolved? Nobody knows as far as I know. How, how it's determined which colony wins and, and, and when. Because <laughs> these, these piles of ants can last for up to 10 hours, but when they finally decide who wins, the, you know, they retreat within 30 minutes. Courtship displays, it's not just birds that do this either. Insects can, can do uh, all kinds of beautiful behaviors to impress the opposite sex. Here we have a couple of robber flies, the female is perched on the log there, uh, dining on a, on a prey. They're, they're predatory flies, surprisingly maybe. Uh, and then above her is a male hovering and displaying his uh, beautiful uh, white coat there on the rear of his body and then waving his, the feet of his middle legs that are ornamented with those tufts of hairs. Really, uh, my, Heidi took this picture. It was really amazing to watch this behavior in action. And of course, you know, the, 
the, the males want the outcome of this to be mating. And so uh, you see a lot of insects paired up if you do any observations of insects at all, because if there's one thing they do better than eating is making more insects. Uh, not always successfully. So we have the, the two mason wasps on the, on the right there, the male on top with his bright yellow face. And the female is gyrating to avoid engaging <laughs> Nesting is another behavior that, that some insects do, especially wasps. That's, that's one of the groups that I've become enamored with because they have so many interesting behaviors. But if, you know, who hasn't had a paper wasp nest under the eave of their house, that uncovered paper comb there? And you can watch the entire life cycle of the insect inside these hexagonal cells. Uh, so the ones that have white, a white dome over the top of them, the, there's a pupa wasp in there. And up until then, the cells are open, and there is either an egg in the cell or a larva. And you can watch the, uh, the worker wasps feeding the larvae, uh, even if you get, you can even get pretty close to them if you, if you acknowledge the, the, uh, the body language of the adult wasps. If they're on tiptoe and their wings are splayed, you're a little too close. They'll let you know before they come after you. But other wasps, solitary wasps like sand wasps, they nest in the ground and they move an incredible amount of, of soil uh, just with these rakes of spines on their, on their front legs. Really remarkable to watch. Most insects have to groom because they need to keep their locomo locomotory appendages uh, working properly, so they groom their wings and, and legs. They have to keep their sensory appendages in, in tip-top shape so they can detect either food or potential predators. And so you see insects pausing often on broad-leaved foliage to groom themselves. It's a great opportunity to get photos because they're actually sitting relatively still. And they may also expose parts of their body when they're grooming that you don't see normally. And so it's easier to identify them when you see those body parts. Uh, this fly on the left, by the way, um, is using its hind legs to groom its eyes. I mean, you know, sign that thing up for Cirque du Soleil, right? If you get close to some insects, they may uh, go into some kind of defensive display, like the mantis there that's not too keen on me holding it. Uh, but other insects may have a much more passive uh, display, such as the sawfly larva that has curled its head under most of its body there. And it also has chemicals that it can secrete to repel uh, potential enemies. Insect, many predatory insects, you can watch them hunting. And this is a blue mud wasp that I watched on our house land, purposely land on the web of a house spider, then proceed to shake the web vigorously, as you can see in the upper right picture. And the spider was duped into thinking that it had prey. And so it ran down and the wasp stung it. And then is going to fly it back to her mud nest where she'll stuff it in a mud cell along with several other paralyzed spiders, lay an egg on the last victim, seal the cell, and then start the process all over again. But hunting can also be more passive. An ambush type of, of hunter is the antlion. And so at the bottom of these little funnels, maybe you've seen them in your own yard, they're typically they typically build these, these uh, traps in very fine, dry soil. So they're often under overhangs, roof overhangs, or at the base of trees where they stay pretty dry. And at the bottom of the pit is the insect larva that you see in the insect photo, these big sickle-like jaws. And so when it, a small insect falls into that pit, the antlion grabs it injects enzymes that both paralyze the prey and start to digest it, and that's how it feeds. Now, insects have a different kind of anatomy than vertebrates do, and so they have what's called an exoskeleton on the outside of their body. And so in order to grow, they have to molt that exoskeleton periodically. And 
witnessing that is a really spectacular uh, event. And so here we have a cicada that is emerging from his previous stage as an underground nymph and becoming a winged adult. And so this typically takes place under the cover of darkness when the insect is a little less vulnerable to being spotted by a visual predator. And uh, the, it starts out as very soft and, 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 uh, and almost colorless. And then slowly it hardens and pigments manifest themselves. So if you see what you think is an albino insect, a pure white insect, it's likely an insect that has just molted and pigments haven't uh, come to fruition yet. Well, birds aren't the only uh, organisms that undertake migrations. And of course, most of us are familiar with the, the journey of the monarch butterfly uh, from the eastern half of North America down to Mexico uh, in the fall. But it turns out that other insects migrate as well. They just don't necessarily do it annually like the monarch, but in periods of abundance, they may uh, migrate. The painted lady butterfly in the upper right there is a good example of this. Uh, they literally fly to greener pastures that can support more of their offspring uh, if they build up a large population. We also now know that dragonflies, certain species of dragonflies are migratory, or at least they're, they're uh, definitely performing mass directional movement. Uh, and some species we know migrate even between continents, like the, the, uh, the globe skimmer. But the green darner that I'm showing in the bottom right here is another one. Uh, that, that migrates long distances as well, but, but usually uh, along coastlines. Insects uh, often exhibit uh, you know, profound abundance, and uh, this can be very harrowing if you don't know what's going on, right? But swarm the noun is a pretty innocuous event for an insect. So. Uh, or, or for you, your safety is not imperiled by a swarm of insects. Now, you don't want yellow jackets to swarm you the verb. Uh, that's a whole nother matter. <laughs> but for example, if you encounter a honeybee swarm like the, the one in the lower left there, that represents a splitting of a colony from an existing hive. And this mass of bees is now uh, hung up in this bivouac and they're sending out scouts to, to find hollow trees or other potential nesting sites that they can then make into a, a true residence. And at this time, they do not have large numbers of vulnerable larvae, eggs, and pupae to defend. So there's nothing to defend here. So you can walk right up to this, this mass of, of bees with, with impunity. They're not interested in defending anything. Um, termites and ants. Uh, termites being the lower right, ants the upper left in this uh, photo. Um, they liberate new reproductives at certain times of the year. So that means qu reproductives means queens and males. And so they liberate large numbers synchronously with other colonies in the neighborhood that are unrelated. So they are, don't have the you know, uh, genetic bottleneck as a result of breeding among themselves. And so at that time, they're spectacularly abundant. They feed a lot of birds and other insects at that time, especially uh, the termites. Midges in the top right there, they're very much mosquito-like. And, and many people uh, interpret swarms of midges as, for swarms of, of mosquitoes. Midges do not bite. If you're the tallest object in the landscape, the males may form a swarm over your head. <laughs> and you can hear them very clearly. Uh, but they're not in any way harmful. They're trying to attract females by massing together. Box elder bugs in the center top there, they're probably gathering on the side of your house right now because they want to slip under the siding and other snug places for the winter. Some insects sleep. And uh, when they do this, especially the bees and the wasps, they adopt these specific body postures uh, to do so. So on the bottom right, we have a cuckoo bee, one of the solitary native bees that we have, has just locked onto that uh, tamarisk 
a, a piece of foliage there with her jaws and is just hanging off there. You know, now I can't, I can't imagine just you know glomming onto the, you know, to the, you know, the to the headboard of the bed and just hanging there for the night. I don't, I don't know what, what possesses them to do this, but they, you know, seem to be perfectly comfortable. Uh, you know, the thread waisted wasp on the left, she's doing the same thing, but she's at least hanging on with the rest of her legs there, right? And then the cuckoo wasp in the top right wraps her whole body around uh, a, a stem. So if you go out late in the afternoon, just before sunset, you can often find uh, these kinds of insects settling down for the night, and at which times they're not at all um, aggressive or, could, or anything that could be interpreted that way. Some other bees and wasps sleep in groups, and this is usually a male thing, and I'm not sure exactly why. There are some that have both males and females, but typically it's a bachelor party. <laughs> and so here we have long-horned uh, uh, bees on the left. Again, they're a native solitary species, but they, they come together as a group uh, to sleep. And on the right, we have flower wasps, and they may gather to amplify those warning colors of black and yellow that say, don't mess with me, I can sting. Even though uh, in, in bees and wasps, it's only the female that, can, that has a sting. Well, insects are cold-blooded. And so as a result of that, they need to warm themselves up some way to, uh, to get their body functioning at, at, uh, at top speed. And so again, they'll often adopt a particular posture to do that. You may see butterflies, for example, that seem to be tipped over because they're, they're, they're presenting the greatest surface area possible to the sun to get uh, you know, maximum quick uh, uh, heating. And the grasshopper here has dropped its uh, hind leg, so it's exposing its abdomen, the, its body core, basically, to the, the most, uh, most of the sun there. And the wasp in the top right is doing the same. But the opposite can happen, too. You can get too hot if you're an insect. And so uh, during the heat of the day, they have different behaviors to compensate for that. And so here we have a grasshopper and an ant standing on tiptoe, so they're not scorching their core, their, their body uh, on the substrate that they're perched on. And dragonflies uh, will point themselves you know, directly towards the sun to minimize the amount of radiation reaching their, their body. And that's called obelisking in, in dragonflies. Well, another, uh, another reason I like to go looking for insects is the potential for discovery is just huge. Um, I mean, you know, somebody had to find this flamingo in Kansas, right? And we, <laughs> we were very grateful for that. If you had a chance to go see it, I hope you all did. Um, but again, for insects, unless the thing is of economic importance, we, we don't know that much about it. So your likelihood of having, you know, finding a, a a uh, county record or maybe even a state record, maybe even something new to science, is, is better than winning the lottery. Uh, now, Heidi found this beetle when we were living in Colorado, Colorado Springs. And she asked me, well, what is this thing? And I said, well, I, I know it's a flower scarab beetle of some sort, but after that, I really don't know. I hadn't seen anything like it before. And so she put some images online, and it turns out that the um, curator of entomology at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science happens to be a world authority on scarab beetles. And so when he got a look at this, he said, well, congratulations. We haven't documented that species in Colorado for over 100 years. And this is not a small insect. It's, it's easily the size of my thumbnail. Uh, and it's day active. Now, granted, when they fly, they look a lot like a bumblebee. Okay, but it's not something you're going to uh, easily overlooked, but you know, it turns out that, uh, that oh, they're dirt common. You know, and so here, <laughs> um, you know, these were at Cheyenne Mountain uh, in uh, on the outskirts of Colorado Springs, and they they liked as many scarab beetles do. They like to feed on on uh, oozing sap from from wounds of on plants and trees, and indeed that's what these were doing on on uh, Gamble's Oak there. Now, back in my day, when I first started getting, I'm going to date myself now. Uh, 
I had to go looking for insects all by myself, and usually nobody else wanted any part of that. Okay, but, to, but today, thanks to, to social media and what have you, bug watching is cool. Um, this is, maybe this is not your idea of fun even as a birder. This is McGee Marsh, the boardwalk in McGee Marsh during the biggest week in American birding. Uh, if, if you can stand the crowd and you've never been, highly recommended. You can see warblers at, at eye level uh, all day long. Um, but yeah, there's, there's now a social element to, to insect watching as, as well. Heidi and I participated in uh, an ode blitz in New Mexico a few years ago, and ode is short for odonata, which is the order of damselflies and dragonflies. And so we got to spend, what, two or three days in, on the Gila River by Gila uh, Cliff Dwellings National Monument in one of the most spectacularly scenic places I've ever been with, with great people. It, it doesn't get much better than that. And we did find some, some uh, county records for that county as well in, in, for dragonflies. And when we lived in Colorado, the Mile High Bug Club there in Colorado Springs would have an annual grasshopper hunt at a ranch between Colorado Springs and, and Pueblo. It's an 80,000 acre ranch. And as such, it has a lot of different habitats in it. On one occasion, in one day, we found 40 different species of grasshoppers. Real, real diversity just in one small group of insects. There's also global events you can participate in. And, and one of my favorites is National Moth Week. Uh, it now does take place around the world. Next year, it's going to be July 20th through 28th. And typically, a public event for this, you hang out a white sheet and suspend a, a UV or black light in front of it. And usually, you have some white lights in there as well. And the sheet is a reflector to magnify the light, but it's also a surface where the insects land. And again, for the vast majority of moths, they aren't pest species. They're just really super diverse, and we don't know anything about them. Sometimes we don't know what the caterpillar stage is, or what it eats, uh, or where the adults are found. So, you know, minimal participation in an event like this can yield spectacular uh, results. And again, I don't know if this is a perk of, of birding or bug watching, but there's certainly a challenge in identifying the critter. <laughs> uh, I could not tell you what flycatcher this is, by the way. I'm pretty sure that we photographed this in southeast Colorado in a willow grove, but af after that, I'm not sure. But there's aspects of insects that make it even more challenging, uh, one being sexual dimorphism, where the male and female look so different, you could expect that they're two different species. And, and this is a good example, the common whitetail, a very common dragonfly you'll see around most ponds uh, or even away from water. The male, the mature males have this bright chalk white abdomen and, and these broad black bands on their wings. But the females have a brown abdomen with ivory uh, you know, uh, markings on them. And then the wings have black spots rather than, than the broad bands. But sexual dimorphism can be even more extreme. There's many insects where the female is wingless. And the, in the case of the tussock moths, this, this goes across the board, as far as I'm aware. The male, perfectly moth-like, with, with a you know, full set of wings and those feathery antenna that we think of when we think of moths, right? But the female is just this basically hairy bag of eggs. Uh, <laughs> and here she's hanging onto the cocoon that she emerged from. And she'll lay her eggs on that as well. Um, but she emits a, a scent, a pheromone, a sexual pheromone, that then attracts the male. And that's why he's got those antenna to tune in to, to find her. But if you saw these two together, you, wouldn't even, you might even not even know the female was a moth. Mimicry. Uh, this fools me a lot of times. <laughs> so on the one hand, we have this uh, yellow jacket on the left, and then many different kinds of flies have co-evolved to mimic the warning colors of the wasp, even though the flies don't sting or in any way uh, are in any way harmful or able to defend themselves. 
uh, they just mimic both the appearance and the behavior of the yellow jacket to escape uh, predators that way. Lots of insects do this. Um, I could spend a whole talk just on that. <laughs> the metamorphosis, metamorphosis is probably the, the, the biggest uh, 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 wrench that insects throw at us when trying to identify them, right? Because you know, forgive me if I laugh at your third year gulls and your winter uh, you know, warblers, but at least they still look like birds, okay? <laughs> but here, not so much, right? Uh, you know, it's hard to imagine that that green worm-like thing is going to eventually turn into a two-tailed swallowtail there, but there we go. And if you saw this thing on your rose bush, your first instinct might be, oh, it's eating my roses. That's got to go. I got to break out the, the, the pesticides or whatever you use to, to control your pest. But if you did that, well, you know, this is the larva of a lady beetle. And so the, lar the larva and the adult beetle are both eating the aphids that are eating your roses. So you don't want to, you don't want to erase those, those, uh, those larva. And the same thing with this thing. It's like if you saw this slug-like thing, you might not even think it's an insect, for starters. Um, it, you know, well, what, what the heck is that? And what, is it eating my rose bushes? Well, no. It's also eating the aphids. And then it turns into a flower fly that is going to help pollinate flowers. So again, you know, it, it, it pays to understand um, <laughs> what different things are going to turn into and what they look like when they're not adults, but it's very challenging. Okay, well, how do we begin to, to watch insects? Well, if, at this time of year, you know, maybe you should do what this young lady is doing and visit the butterfly house and practice, <laughs> right? Um, because it's a little bit hard to find insects active at this time of year, especially as the temperatures get colder. Uh, but in any event, the equipment that you need, well, let's start with technique first. My friend MJ uh, Hatfield says well, you should walk slow, look close, and be curious. And that's, that's good, but I'd even take it one step further and I'd just say stay put, <laughs> or look close and be curious because insects are very well tuned to sense motion. So the slightest movement, and especially a fast movement, is going to spook them, and they're going to fly away from you. So the, the more time you spend actually just sitting and looking around the edge of a pond or, or a patch of flowers or even a mud puddle, the more insects you're going to see because they're going to interpret you as just another fixture in the landscape. Well, what kind of equipment do you need? Not much, and you probably own some of it already. If you have binoculars, especially if they're close focusing, that will allow you to focus on a subject, you know, eight to 10 feet away, eight to 12 feet away. Uh, it gives you good resolution of detail in the subject, even a, something the size of a butterfly or a, or a, or a fly or a bee, um, while not, uh, you know, you're not close enough to spook it. So it's still doing its natural behaviors that way. If you have a camera, or these days, even your phone probably takes better pictures than my camera does, uh, you can get pictures of the thing for, for later uh, help in identifying it. Magnifiers are good to have if you, for really tiny insects, which is most insects. Those leaf hoppers, by the way, that we saw a minute ago, most of their diversity is under five millimeters. Really, really tiny. Uh, a field guide can be helpful. Uh, of course, I'm biased that way because I've helped write one, but um, Remember, they're much more diverse than birds, so not every insect is going to be in an insect field guide. Sometimes it's better to go to some of the online resources that we'll speak to in a moment. Keep a notebook. You know, write down where you were, when you were, both the date and the time of day, what the weather was like, what the habitat is like. Because as I mentioned, a lot of these factors, we don't know what it is for a lot of these insects. And then please share your observations. There's a lot of platforms that you can use now to do that. Uh, iNaturalist and Project NOAA both cover every kind of living thing from lichens to fish. So you know anything you observe can go on there and help both the general public find out what's in their neighborhood and also help scientists discover new, you know, new data points as well. Bug Guide is bugguide.net, and it covers 
terrestrial arthropods of North America, North of Mexico. So that includes insects, spiders, other arachnids, crustaceans that are, that are in freshwater or terrestrial. Uh, but even social media, there's a lot of interest groups on Facebook and, and other uh, social media platforms that you can go to for help and, and identify, or just to share your, uh, your, your prize uh, images. Okay, well, why should we bother? Other than you know the rewards that we're, we've been talking about, there's other good reason to, uh, to be bug watchers. One is that we can track range expansions. And as climate changes, we're seeing more and more of this. I have a friend in Ohio who specializes in recording the songs of Katie Diz and Crickets. And she also takes images of them and, and posts them as well. And so she's, I think she's documented this particular species, the modest Katie did now, all the way up to the shore of Lake Erie. So we can see the black dots were probably pre-2010. And since then, you can see how it's the, the insect species has expanded its range further north and further west. So this gives us an idea of what kinds of trends are happening uh, to insects with, with climate change and habitat uh, disruptions. You might even discover a new species. Um, when Heidi was at the, at the zoo, she brought this insect home one night and I said, oh, okay, that looks like a, a blue mud dauber. Great, I, I don't have that many good photos of it. I'll put it in the casserole dish that we use as a studio <laughs> and take pictures of it. And when I looked at the pictures, it, was, it became instantly clear this was not a blue mud dauber. It was not any mud dauber I'd ever seen before. And it turns out this was the first United States record for this Eurasian mud dauber, Skelfron curvatum. And, and since then, it's been found in many parts of the United States. But, but as far as I know, Heidi's was the first find of this species in the US. You can also, through our observations, monitor the, the uh, spread uh, or uh, occurrence of invasive species. And I know that's a loaded term these days, and for good reason. Uh, the spongy moth, for example, used to be called the gypsy moth, but that's a derogatory uh, name for the Romani people, and so we've changed that uh, to, to spongy moth, representing the condition of the egg case that the female moth lays. But European paper wasp, emerald ash borer, Asian longhorn beetle, of course, the spotted lanternfly is the one we're worried about most right now. It's really spreading quite rapidly from the East Coast. You might also document a new host record. If you know your plants, you're already way ahead of me even, because uh, if I find an insect feeding on a plant, I may recognize the insect, but I don't know what it's eating. <laughs> so if you can make those kinds of associations, there's a very good chance it could be something that, that has not been observed as a host before. So you know, it, it really pays to even things that you think might be mundane information or something that's already known may not be. And the same goes true for, for uh, parasitoid wasps or, or predatory wasps. You might get a new host record uh, for one of those as well. Well, the bad news in all this is that there's fewer insects to watch. Uh, the, it, there's general consensus now that insects are in a, a decline to, to what degree is, a, is still debatable. Uh, but both abundance and diversity seems to seem to be a bit threatened. And you know, well, what are the causes of this? Well, it's nothing new. Okay, climate, with, with the exception maybe of climate change, but but other uh, factors have have contributed to this deforestation or habitat destruction in general is is probably the leading factor. The scale and intensity of agriculture that has led to deforestation and habitat destruction. And with those huge monocultures, the only way to control pest insects is through the application of pesticides. Urbanization, what isn't being plowed under is being paved over. Urban sprawl is a big problem. Pollution, both air pollution, water pollution, uh, solid wastes, and invasive species as we just mentioned. 
And I want to highlight light pollution. Now, I know we just talked about putting out a black light to attract moths and other insects that are they're neat to watch uh, uh, in, uh, in their nocturnal activities. You know, those doing that occasionally is not a problem. What's a problem is nightly, uh, you know, even the glow of a distant metropolis will affect insects in rural areas. And of course it disrupts the behaviors of nocturnal insects uh, because they're used to darkness, but it also extends the activity period of diurnal insects, shortening their lifespan and disrupting their re reproductive potential. It's even worse for aquatic insects because certain uh, wavelengths of light uh, disrupt the ability of the female to recognize water where she would normally deposit her eggs and so she's laying eggs on car hoods and things like this uh, instead. So an uh, underrated uh, problem for insects is a consistent light pollution. So what are the biggest things you can do to, to help promote insect diversity or biodiversity in general for that matter? You know, what, what steps can we take? Well, is it joining an organization that's dedicated to invertebrate conservation, like the Xerces Society? Yeah, sure, that helps a great deal. The Xerces Society uh, now has you know, global uh, activity uh, from Madagascar to, to South America. Uh, started out as kind of a butterfly conservation organization, but it's now uh, deals with pollinators, especially forest insects, aquatic insects. They have a, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of good activities that they're engaged in. Was well, it to landscape with native plants or to plant a pollinator garden like this one in Tucson? Yeah, that that definitely helps. You're 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 giving insects plants they recognize and can make use of. Absolutely, if you're doing that, excellent. Please keep doing it. If you haven't started, eh, you know at least be weed tolerant. If you, unless it's a noxious weed that's a federally or, or state listed uh, problem, uh, the, the thing that's volunteering itself in your yard is likely something that's, that's native or at least naturalized, like, like dandelions would fit that, for example. But the number one thing you can do that nobody talks about is to stop consuming. And, I don't, and by that I mean multinational corporate level consumption. Uh, if you the, the the more you shop closer to home, especially for agriculture, the, the, the better off. And I know I know it's a big ask, and I'm guilty myself, <laughs> right? I I like my chips and, and cookies and, and other processed foods as much as the next guy, um, you know. But we do take advantage of the farmers markets that we have in Leavenworth and surrounding areas. Um, uh, I eat bananas. I drink coffee and I love chocolate. And you know, does that make me a colonist all over again? Or still? Yeah, maybe. I mean, if my expectation as a person in North America in the developed world is that I expect the Southern Hemisphere to, to feed me first and I'm contributing to poverty and destruction of the forest for palm oil plantations, yeah, maybe I'm doing something wrong. So I'm having to start questioning, and it's taken me this long to even start questioning what do my behaviors in the marketplace mean for the planet as a whole? And I don't think you can guilt people into uh, being vegetarians or you know, otherwise changing habits overnight. Uh, maybe it's a matter of degree. You know, I can't remember the last time I had a hamburger and I like that. Um, you know, Beef is not what's for dinner every night. It is probably once or twice a month. Um, so I think it's more a matter of degree. You know, challenge your comfort level a little bit maybe, um, but no one is gonna fault you uh, for, for not stopping whatever you're doing cold turkey. Um, big ag, you know, you're not gonna find a regal fritillary in the middle of a cornfield, a soybean field, or a wheat field, maybe you'll find them on a properly grazed prairie range, okay? We need to try and shrink agriculture as best as we can, and, and, and that's where, you know, trying to, um, you know, 
be a friend to local agriculture, I think, is really important. And with that, I don't want you to stop consuming my books, however. Okay. <laughs> and with that, I want to thank you. I want to thank Mark for being my contact person. And we had a little bit of a rocky a hiccup uh, this week because Heidi was, was sick all of last week, and we weren't sure we were going to present in person or via Zoom <laughs> until about a day or two ago. Uh, I think it was Jackie Augustine who referred me, and if, if I'm incorrect in that, I apologize, my wife, uh, Heidi, for putting up with me while I organized these things. Uh, Princeton University Press is my publisher, and if you uh, want to buy the books later uh, and you use the code ERE30, that would be good for a 30% discount from the, from the publisher. My mentors, past, present, and future, I have one of them in the audience tonight, Dr. Mary Liz Jameson. Uh, I didn't learn what I shared with you tonight all by myself. I've had many patient and, and uh, influential, uh, uh, kind uh, uh, people in my life who've helped me learn these things. And thank all of you for attending. time for questions, but if so, I'll entertain them. In the back. So are neonicotinoids the worst pesticide? I hear a lot of bad things about neonicotinoids. <clears throat> I'm running dry here. The question was, Is are neonicotinoids the worst pesticides now, I think the way they're being used is more of a problem than, than uh, I mean, they're just, they're, they're the new DDT in, in terms of they're the, the latest thing that we embrace too enthusiastically. Um, I, I don't know, and I'm not a toxicologist, so I can't speak to that directly. Uh, if anybody else can, I'm, I'm happy to learn from them. Um, but, you know, again, it's the size of, of agriculture that's the problem. Um, you know, we, we can't control pests when we have acres and acres and acres of a crop with no place for, you know, native predators and parasitoids to come from to get into these crops to control the pests. We have no, no other recourse. That's, that's the real problem. And, and it's, it's being solved in part now by prairie strips. Uh, I went to the, the prairie conference in Iowa earlier this year, and one of the things they were discussing was prairie strips. And so you have, um, you know, row crops interrupted by these strips of, of native vegetation, and they serve as reservoirs for a lot of very helpful insects. That kind of thing is what's going to help. It's not going to be, you know, the next next generation of insecticides. You know, the, the, every revolution magnifies the previous one, right? So. We had the agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution, <coughs> mechanized agriculture, and allowed these huge monocultures to take hold. Then they became corporate-run entities, in a lot of cases, anyway. Uh, and now we have the tech revolution that is, that is further kind of subtracting the human element from it, which I also think is, a, is, is tragic at an ethical level, uh, if not an economic level. Uh, so, you know. What is, the, what is the next way of treating pests? Um, I don't know. If we keep accelerating the size of agriculture, I don't know what that's going to look like, but I don't want to think about it. <laughs> yeah? What is your favorite bug and why? And then what's, <laughs> what is one of the biggest epiphanies you've had in your study? Oh, wow. Two really great questions there. What, what is my favorite insect and why? And what, what is the greatest epiphany I've had? Hmm. Um, it's, really, it's really hard to choose a favorite insect, but I mean, I, if I'm honest, I, I got into wasps because nobody could call me a sissy for catching something that could fight back. <laughs> okay? And, and when you're a guy, that's a big thing. Um, but. The more, <laughs> the more I learned about their behaviors and their diversity, the more I, fascinating I found them uh, anyway. And so I'm still learning 
new things about wasps every day. I mean, you know, there's there was a, a wasp identification course offered a couple of years ago, and so I enrolled in that, and I learned a lot more than than I contributed to that. And even between that year and the next year they offered it, there were like five new families of wasps that people had figured out. So, I mean, the, it, things are just constantly changing. I mean, we're seeing this a little bit with birds now, the bird name, you know, bird names for birds movement is changing that aspect of it. But in insects, it's like, okay, when we did this DNA analysis, it reorganized everything. So, I mean, it's really, oh, it's just mind blowing. Yeah. And okay, what's my greatest epiphany? Probably that I am a writer first and I'm an entomologist second. Um, you know, I went to school in Oregon State for entomology and it didn't agree with me. And I, I, I'm like, why? You know, and I remember jogging out into the, uh, uh, the outskirts of town in Corvallis one day and watching the, the reflection of the sunset on Mount Hood. And I was taking so, a soils course at the time. And I looked at that and I, I literally said out loud, how can you reduce that to a soil profile? And I wish I had realized what I was saying at the time, but it was this, you know, I totally respect science. And I, I consider myself a science communicator because I take what scientists spits out and I try and translate it for, for other people. Um, but the abstraction of science through you know, math and, and statistics and things like that, that's what didn't agree with me. You know, I, I re recognize its importance, but it's not what I was born to do. And so recognizing eventually that, oh, I'm a writer, uh, that's what I'm good at. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a communicator first. That was my biggest epiphany for sure. Good question. I appreciate that one. Thanks. Yeah. What is that on the screen? Ah, this is a rosy maple moth. And um, yeah, in, we're blessed in our, our Leavenworth neighborhood to have some oak trees around. And so, you know, oaks are, are if you, any of you are familiar with Doug Tallamy, his big uh, promotion is that everybody should have oak trees in their yard uh, because they support the greatest diversity of insect life. Uh, especially caterpillars, uh, and so uh, now we do. Our neighbor does have a maple, but it's not a native maple, so we don't have these. At least I haven't seen them yet. Um, but um, it's a, one of the giant silk moths, even though it's not that big. <laughs> Some of the giant silk moths are only this big, uh, and uh, true to their name, they feed on maples in the caterpillar stage. Uh, but if you if you went further east and south, you'd probably find these. I'm not quite sure how far west they range. Okay, well I look forward to speaking with you individually if you're too shy to ask questions. <laughs> I'm shy too. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm an introvert disguised as an extrovert, believe me. Did you, 